So we thought for the last half hour we'd just kind of have an open discussion and think about what kinds of issues came up today that we think might be kind of worthy of pursuing later or what we think are kind of important topics um, that have come up today. So I think one of them that's come up is definitely CMR. John said that he might be able to help facilitate <laughs> a discussion about it. <laughs> Um, I think one of them that came up is definitely the CMR. I think we can agree that the CMR is an issue here in Massachusetts. <laughs> Actually, this is sort of a question for Linda, so I want to get her attention on because she's not really <laughs> yeah. But because um, she had talked to we had talked in a working group about legis about um, going to the general court and talking to them about allocating money to some, to authentication. But I'm wondering if we have to go to all of the branches separately now and advocate at each of them. Okay. Yeah. Or, or it's just getting money from the general court to be given to all the branches enough. And, and I'll never know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> now that I have your attention, the question I had for you was, we had been talking in the working group about the need to go and um, uh, talk to the general court about getting money allocated to electronic resources, but do we actually have to go to all three branches and um, lobby? Each branch separately, or is it enough just to get money sent over from the general court? Well, it depends on what you want to do. Okay. Is, I mean, I, I, there are the two obvious sources of funding would be operating funds for which you would go to the legislature and have to you know, put together a plan and convince them that you have some something, some specific credible project you want to have funded. And then there's filing for, um, and I'm not sure, I know that the agencies can do this. Um, you, I, I, I think if you're on the court side, you can certainly go to the legislature for capital funding, and they have given the courts a fair amount of capital money for IT projects. And you kind of, you know, lump this together with IT. For the executive department agencies, they have the IT bond funds. There's about $80 million a year, you know, most of it tied up and uh, committed fairly well. Kind of time for projects, but there's small amounts of money often left over at the end of the year for things. So you have a couple different, um, you know, funding. And, and, and not, not just getting money, but also getting, we have to go to each branch separately and convince them this is an important thing to do. Oh, well, you, you could go to them individually, or you could try to bring together the stakeholders in those communities in a room and say, here's the problem. And I think you've articulated this problem great today, but I, I was talking to my husband this morning about what in heaven's name do these, these people want to know from me? I don't know you look across the top of the <laughs> Because I had no idea, and I don't think people like to get any idea that people care about this as a source of open data. So I think you need to, before you go to anybody, I think it'd be helpful to articulate, you know, five points of what you're trying to achieve, and then some incremental steps you'd like to take, um, and try to get some um, support throughout all of those communities. Uh, and then there are kind of two types of people that you want to approach. I mean, I think you want to get to the to the technologists, obviously, because they would say this is this is easy. This is not a complicated technology problem. It's not an expensive technology problem. You throw up a page, you tell the agencies to put their things online. You throw up a page, you, know, you direct, have people put their content up, and then you just direct people to it. It's not that hard to do through mass.gov, so it's not a big technology problem. But your voices are not being heard, is what I'm saying. You're not a coalesced community to us. Uh, I don't know people who I've literally never heard this articulated, and I think they you know, listen pretty well in the legal and, and, and technology community. So getting your stakeholders together, why is this important? What's your vision for change? What's the problem? Um, I think that'd be helpful. Come up with an elevator speech. Well, that's the whole point of, of this process. In fact, tomorrow one of the goals is to come up with a core set of principles oh, that great. there appears to be general consensus around. Um, that's something that Professor Lessig and, and I did on um, distribution of bulk government data, and that's more general than the law. Yeah. Uh, but there were a set of eight principles that said, look, you, you should do it in the raw format, and there shouldn't be a license on it. And there were some very concrete principles, and that's what we're trying to articulate with primary legal materials. First, to define what we mean by that, and then what are the technical and the non-technical principles about how they should be distributed. I think when you're talking to technologists, if you classify this as kind of an open data issue, they'll get it right away. Yeah. But right now, our technologists, when they think about open data, they're thinking about data from a massive database about how many people registered the car last year, how many people applied for transitional assistance. I'm thinking about this. Well, you know, that was the impetus for this effort is watching people like Vivek Kundra do data.gov, 
uh, watching states beginning to embrace that, and that's what led to the idea of law.gov. In fact, it was explicitly taken mm -hmm. from data.gov, was the idea that this concept should apply to legal materials, which are special, and um, are special in many ways because they, they have so many jurisdictions, um, they have different requirements, um, things like authenticity are, are different in the real world. And so it was directly inspired by the open data movement. And There's some great parallels, really. Yeah. Just absolutely. to get people to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a, a lot of the workshop process is trying to establish enough legitimacy so that we can, in fact, go to people and say, gee, um, you should come in. So instead of, for example, the CIO of, in the White House, who's a very good guy and very senior, um, but he's not the general counsel, right? And he's certainly not the chief of staff of the White House. And, um, and so basically trying to walk up that, that food chain. Um, and so having done today's workshop is very useful because you're then in a position to say, gee, a, a lot of people participated in a one-day workshop um, this summer, and now we're going to have another one that's going to be a, a larger audience and a more developed theme and, and more concrete evidence if the, if the Massachusetts inventory is, is more formalized at that point, there might be a, a, a better briefing as to the status of the law in, in Massachusetts. And certainly my eyes were open when, when I saw some of uh, the work that the folks are doing in the trial court law library in which you're harvesting from other government <laughs> agencies because you're worried they're going to delete the data. Um, I would think any state archivist or state CIO would look at that and their jaw would drop. Bar Association, Legal Services Corporation people. Um, you know, there are associations of, of court reporters. Um, there are associations of government um, employees of various sorts. Uh, I know at the national level there's association of secretaries of state. I imagine there's an association of, of county officials. There's probably another one of city council members. There's no county government. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then you're we right. not. <laughs> 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 at the national level, are we presenting at all to the National Center for State Courts or for now? I know I want the heads of all the judicial branches. Is there going to be a formal presentation? Is it called? We had uh, the National Center for State Courts was a strong participant in the Cornell two-day technical summit. Okay. Um, so they're paying attention. And um, one of the things we've learned is that some people will participate early on during the workshop to get their views out, and others want to know what the results are at the end of the process. And so beginning in September, we, we know there's going to be a year of briefings to groups like the National Center for the State Courts, um, and particularly groups like the National Association of Supreme Court Justices. And That's what I want. Sometimes this message may go better on a national level that mm -hmm. it's not us going and saying, SJC did this better. We can do that on an informal level, but I think hearing it is a national issue. Yeah. They put down a better carpet for people to move on than us confronting. I well, mean, we're, we're turning it, like, we're hoping to turn it into a national issue. And things like the statement of principles, we're hoping will be okay. widely signed by deans of major law schools. Uh, we're hoping to get attention from the Congress, potentially on um, congressional hearings. Uh, we've already got requests from the Federal Trade Commission and the Senate for briefings um, on the report. And, and kind of as those begin to come out, that's evidence that can be used in Massachusetts to point to the fact that, that it's not just you doing this, that, that it truly is something that a lot of people are considering. We've had several secretaries of state participating in the workshops and, and paying very close attention. Um, and people like the Federal Trade Commission, the, the letter from the chairman said this is a core issue for the commission. You know, they're in the consumer protection business um, and they view this as, as a core part of their mission. So, uh, I think there's potential for getting that. Yeah, I also wondered to what extent you could start small and build some success stories. So for example, the, I, I used to serve on the information, information Technology Advisory Committee for the town of Brookline. And I have PhD in computer science, and these things never occurred to me, right? It's just mm -hmm. like, well, of course it's online. And sometimes I would go and look <laughs> and, and read the laws. But the idea of putting the, making sure the regulations are, you know, that the name of the URL doesn't change over time, things like that. And I mean, Brooklyn is you know a fairly wealthy town that's very, uh, you know, it's full of technology professionals. I mean, they, they care about these sort of things if, if they know to care about them. Um, and also on, on the other side, I mean, so I, you might try to find an ally. And I think once you have a really strong success story in a town, you know, a sort of medium-sized place like Brooklyn, that that's a story you can then carry on to the bigger level. Um, and, and in that vein, I would talk to the Massachusetts um, Municipal Association, which is this very good organization of, I think, town managers. I'm not quite sure who's the members of that, but it's this association of you know all the municipalities get together and they decide on policy and they share ideas. You know, they're lobbying for the you know 
the health insurance for town employees, things now. So I mean, it's, it's a very effective organization, and I think it is very good at turning around and influencing state policy because that's what it has to do is to survive. So definitely talk to people there. Uh, and then, sort of on the, in the mere side of that, I wonder if organizations like the Massachusetts Home Builders Association, which I largely think of lobbying on the other side of issues that I care about, but I mean, they're an extremely powerful lobbying organization, and this must matter to them, right? If you said, hey, wouldn't it be great if you guys could, you know, click one button and get all the regulations and be able to browse this and zoning, and they would say, yeah, you well, know, here's a million dollars, let's start the lobbying campaign. I, mean, I think they would they would put some you know, serious investment into getting that. This, this, issue, of this issue is of great interest um, on both sides of the aisle right. and the Chamber of Commerce types. Uh, sure. Eugene Meyer, the Federalist Society, participated in the Law Doc workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cato Institute is all over this. Right. In terms of local interest groups that actually know how to call up you know, members of the House and Senate and say, hey, let's get something on the agenda. Home Bill Associations, contractors, and these are powerful organizations that Probably, you know, probably just live with it now and sort of live with the pain and, and don't realize that, you know, with some muscle that their world could be better, that their costs could go down and that their jobs become easier. Uh, Michelle, you use the, the, the booklet that's called from the Mass Municipal Profile. So in the back of the book, they have a list of all the municipal organizations. And it's very easy to notify them and to get in touch with all the municipal police, fires, clerks. <coughs> One of the most successful strategies is not advocacy, it's showing by doing. And um, that's some place where perhaps Berkman or some of the other universities around here, um, you know, if there's an undergrad looking for something cool to do, um, go take that city council's municipal ordinances, go get all the back copies, reformat it, make it look wonderful. Um, and that's actually a semester project in many cases. These are not that hard to do. Um, and, and that kind of stuff has just immense impact. It really does. It's much more than, gee, you should be doing this instead of, look, you know, here, this is wonderful. Um, and so I would definitely encourage, um, you know, that that's one great way to do advocacy is to try to get internship programs or other, you know, get the clinics involved. Um, you know, um, fighting the copyright um, restrictions is something that's a wonderful clinical um, type of project. Um, you know, and it's great experience. What about letters to the editor, like the Boston Globe? Does that help anywhere along the process to have them? You know, I think when it's decision time, kind of thing down the line. When it's decision time, right? Yes. When when it's gee, there's a, a decision on the table and the governor needs to you know, or there's a bill about to be introduced, and that, that works very effectively. But but I, I think now it really is um, it, it is building the case and the constituency and the awareness of the issue that is most important. And, and a lot of that is just briefing. It's, it's a matter of knocking on doors. Because, I mean, I'm getting the same thing that, that you're getting. Who knew? And I'm getting it from chief judges of U.S. district courts. And I go see them, and I say, did you know eight states assert strong copyright over their state statutes? And the judges draws <laughs> drop. I go, no, that's not possible. Um, and that's where this national inventory is just so helpful. Um, because you can paint a detailed picture of what's going on and what's available. And, you know, the fact that, that nothing has digital signatures in the state. Um, you know, you can say digital signatures should exist, but when you say there are none, right, people will look at it and say, oh, gosh, you think somebody would have, like, signed something. Actually, I thought some states have. What's that? I thought some states have started. Uh, Delaware is signing their administrative regulations. And does no, does no high web digital signatures on their cases have yeah, a yeah. disaster? Yeah, and again, <laughs> we're, 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 we're looking for the, the success stories as well as, as the disasters. So. Okay. Um, that, that's one of the valuable things about this national inventory is we're able to point to places like Oklahoma that has their full archive online and they issue the final opinions directly from the court. Um, and, and by combining the success stories with the problems and statistics, um, that helps us present the case much better to policymakers. You know? And that lets you in Massachusetts point to other states that are doing it differently and say, gee, we could be doing it just like these guys. I think another thing related to that, Carl, from the Twitter stream this morning, there's some people asking about the data on what the cost of doing this is, the earlier point that it ought to be cheap, and then what the relative benefits are. And I think to the extent that one is writing to you know, three levels of a state government, to be able to say, not only is this a cheap thing to do, but it's a competitive thing, it's a pro-competitive thing to do, and here are three studies that show the extent to which this is obviously economically a good thing, 
And if you're letting copyright or other things kind of get in the way, the copyright thing just seems so colossally stupid, right? That there's no there's no rational basis for that, especially if it's actually working as against you know some economic growth arguments. It's you know basic rationale for copyright that doesn't exist there is already you know blown out of the water. Yep, absolutely. And it's hard to quantify some of this stuff because it's, it's new enough that, that people haven't done those particular studies. But, but you know, economics by analogy can be very powerful. Uh, Roberta Schaefer, the Law Librarian of Congress, when I went to her, um, she immediately picked up on the international trade issue, that it's important to make American law uh, available online because that lets foreigners do business with us more effectively. Right, it makes America more competitive. And it's, it's not, not an aspect of the issue that I had thought of immediately. And, and that's one advantage of this workshop process is you, you begin to pick up all these little details and, and the hope is to weave them all together. I, I, I found uh, very exciting on the open access uh, yeah. benefits, the economic benefits to be, be very eye-opening and I hadn't seen those stats before. So. In terms of the um, thinking at show like kind of what Arne was doing again in Oregon in terms of like showing what you could do, Kyle, is there anybody, I, I'm just thinking of like track fed from Syracuse, which is like a different situation. They take federal data and they mash up like primary law and data. Is there anybody doing that with like state law information, like mashing up state law and open data that's available to like show connections? Oh, um, no, but it would make a wonderful little project. And I mean, I, I'd go pitching that at MIT and Harvard. I mean, I'd go see Johan Pickler and ask him who who you should talk to, and he's probably not going to do it, but, but um, you know. Well, there's also just a really dynamic Gov2O data community. I know yeah. I found I went to that Gov2O thing, Kennedy School, a few months ago, and there's like in this particular area, mm -hmm. there's a huge community in every program I'm going to, there were just so many people just pitching to get their hands on data to do things. And yeah. So it might be a group like we were talking about before, in terms of collaborating with. Yeah. They, you know, to show what you could do. And you just need to find those people that are motivated to do that. I mean, you know, at Princeton, for example, Ed Felton Shop does just an amazing job. And so when the White House was getting the Federal Register ready to go out the door, and it was going out the door in eight days, um, they went to Ed Felton Shop and said, hey, can you do an application in less than eight days that demonstrates how great this is? And they had another word. Um, you know. <laughs>